Park. And uh, you know, I want to thank the, the organizers of Emerging Languages and Strange Group for giving us that one day out of the year, or even our fellow engineering colleagues, let us get to be the language nerds we really are. Uh, you know, but it's not ill time, it's not already place, this is the place to kind of enjoy ourselves. So, uh, in addition, I also want to thank my family who allows me to come here and uh, spend my free time hanging on languages. <coughs> so, why? The first question everyone asks in no language designer wants to hear it is why did you do this? What problem are you trying to solve? What's wrong with closure? What, what problem are you trying to solve there? Um, and I think you all know the first reason any language gets put together is there's an itch the author wants to scratch. Um, in my case, there are two itches I want to scratch. One, I want to explore the concatenative stack-based paradigm, the language, uh, the approach to expressing code. And secondly, I wanted to get a deeper understanding of closure. And you know, we're at the Emerging Languages Camp, and um, do I think Gershwin is an emerging language? Not, not necessarily. But I think closure is an emerging language, and closure is more than an emerging language. I think the interesting part of Gershwin is that it's an extension to closure. Um, so Gershwin is an experiment as an extension to closure to provide, to make a closure that is stack-based and concatenative. So it raises certain questions that I think are worthy of exploration. Um, what makes a language extension worthy? Why would I bother to extend closure as opposed to the language? Why would I want closure as my basis? Um, and then how far can we take it until we've broken what it means to be a language? I don't think Gershwin breaks closure, uh, but you'll be the judge of that at the end of the talk. So um, to kind of evaluate a language design and talk about how it's extensible, I think it's, it's profitable to kind of compare how we study human foreign languages to how we grapple with uh, programming languages. And so I kind of want to take these two in stride and kind of compare and contrast, and uh, we'll explore a little bit of closure and Gershwin implementation along the way. So the first thing that we study as humans when studying a foreign language is usually pronunciation. You've got to spend some time training the muscles of your mouth and your throat to pronounce things correctly. Um, kind of the parallel in programming might be the syntax of the language. Um, so human languages, right, are. It doesn't matter what language you speak or what language you're learning, you're probably doing R wrong when you're learning that foreign language, right? Whether it's a front-rolled R, whether it's a back-rolled R, whether it's maybe an R, maybe an L sound, there's not much distinction, or in English where it's not really even a consonant, it's more of a semi-vowel, right? Um, this is a hard problem. We all have opinions. Um, you know, R, R is just it's a tough one. Um, programming parallel, super quick closure recap um, of what's available in closure. Um, string literals, keywords or symbols, depending on your background. I'm kind of assuming folks are relatively familiar with Clojure. Um, for those watching this video online, I suggest uh, spending time reading some other tutorials and watching some videos. Um, we have uh, symbols, numbers, proper ratios, regular expressions, and then some closure specific things like uh, reader macros for closure bars. So, um, moving along, Lisp essentials, how you call things in Lisps, what you're calling in a Lisp, functions, macros, official forms. And then uh, some of the collections that Clojure has some syntax for um, to include vectors, hash maps, and sets. So this is all of the Clojure primer we get today. Uh, I kind of assume that folks are relatively familiar with, with Clojure, and we'll see enough along the way that I hope folks can absorb if not. So what does Gershwin add? So I said Gershwin is an extension to Clojure. It's an additive extension. The Gershwin, the Gershwin jar uh, can compile any Clojure program that 1.6 master can, comp can compile. Um, but there's some things that it adds to what's available. Um, because it's a stack-based concatenative language, there are no, there's no specific call or invocation syntax. And we'll see what that means when we look at some code examples. And there's no parens to call functions. That seems kind of counterintuitive that a Lisp loses its parens. But they're still there. They have a different purpose. Um, functions aren't called functions in, in concatenative languages. Usually they're usually called words. So we get the vocabulary right here. Functions are called words. And we use, uh, in the fourth tradition, a colon to define words. And we also have anonymous functions. Those are called quotations. And we use uh, this syntax, which is another reader macro, um, for writing quotations. These are the two kind of major additions that Gershwin brings to Clojure. A way to talk about functions as words, because they're going to behave differently than regular functions, and a way to have code that will get executed at some later point, but don't execute it right now, and that's quotations, a somewhat parallel to anonymous functions. Um, the last little tidbit of information that's an addition is that Gershwin words and closure functions can share the same names in the same namespace because they behave differently. And uh, I provide one extra bit of syntax to distinguish when you're talking about a Gershwin word versus a closure function. So that's all that Gershwin adds to closure. And we're going to see there's quite a bit that that brings to the language 
um, that brings to being able to program closure in a concatenative style. Um, I'm in proper programming tutorial style, I'm not going to jump from assuming you didn't even know closure syntax to assuming you know the closure compiler and that these things make sense. Um, <laughs> but for those who are familiar with closure and its compiler, this will make a lot of sense. These are simple additions. So uh, Lisp reader is closure's basic reader or parser. Um, closure doesn't allow adding reader macros um, in regular closure. You can't add any extra special symbols that don't look like S expressions or the, or the syntax that's been defined unless you hack the compiler, which I did. Uh, so we have these two reader macros, as I said before. That first one is for quotations, the equivalent of anonymous functions. And that second one is that special Gershwin var distinction. And the second is that I extended the reader to also be able to parse colons as the beginning of a word definition, in addition to the ex its existing usage in closure, which is for keywords, as we saw before. The only other bookkeeping change that had to happen was I had to increase the, the pushback reader buffer to be able to distinguish between colon plus a space for a word definition and colon and uh, um, an identifier for a keyword. So that's the basics. We can pronounce our R's correctly or, or incorrectly, more than likely. And we mastered the syntax of closure, and we've seen what little things Gershwin, Gershwin adds to closure. Next thing up, words and phrases. Build the basic vocabulary. How do you make sense? What, what, what's the beginning of the semantics of the given human language? Um, and the equivalent, I would say, is the primitives of the language you're dealing with in terms of computer programming. Um, in this case, functions or objects and methods. Um, so this is the second stage of our closure primer, where I assume you're just going to now know how to work in Lisp. Um, plus function with arguments of two and two gives us four. If I have a hash map with an entry of foo bar, and I ask for the foo key, I get that. Uh, closure takes things a bit further than a lot of functional programming languages. Its collections can also act like functions when it makes sense. And so a map can be used as a function for retrieving things out, out of it. So if I invoke that map as a function and pass it the foo keyword as a key, as an argument, it will return the value at that key. And vice versa, keywords are also, are also invocables. And I can do the same thing. So those last three code snippets are equivalent in closure. And uh, I think it's profitable to, to realize that um, not everything you think is a function is a function, and things you think shouldn't be functions are often functions. Um, we have higher order functions. It's a functional language. Uh, I can apply, in this case, you know, the hash map constructor, if you will, and get a hash map from uh, items in a collection, pairwise. And finally, the traditional map, where map takes a function and a collection and maps the function over the collection, determining a collection that is the return values uh, of, of invoking that function for each item in the list. All right, one step further, those are all uh, built-in closure functions. How do we define our own? We can, ha we can have some data. We so def is kind of that, that central form for defining named things in closure. And then defin is a macro on top of that that lets us define functions easily. So here's a simple example of having some, some standalone data um, and then two functions, um, a very simple function of times two, give it an argument x, multiply it by two. We can take it a step further. We can have a generic times n function that itself returns a function that multiplies a given number by the, uh, the n that you supplied. So how would we use this? Again, just trying to show off the, the closure functional aspect. Um, times n2 or return a function that times anything by two and give that four and you get eight. And uh, again, another, another way of showing it, uh, to map a function times n2 over a collection Again, another way, I, I find that it helps when looking at functional languages to take uh, different perspectives on what, where functions can be put and what things expect functions and what things invoke functions. So these are just a couple of examples in closure. All right, so given those examples in, in closure, how would you write them in, in a stack-based language? These are the Gershwin examples that are parallel. Put two on the stack, put two on the stack, put the plus word on the stack, and the plus word will look on the stack, grab its arguments, and put the return value back on the stack. That's four. The same map getting we saw before, I can take uh, a, a map and a keyword and get the value out of it. I can use a map like a function. I can use a keyword like a function. And so in this case, Gershwin has taken the word apply and s s changed what it means from default closure to say, take the thing on the top of the stack, treat it like a word, and give it arguments off the rest of the stack. This is, uh, in, in concatenative stack-based languages, uh, there is generally not variable arity, so you tend to have a lot of functions that have specific arities in the name, like you know foo one, foo two, foo three. If it takes multiple items, in this case, kind of taking a little bit of a Ruby convention, and for 
uh, functions that need to take a collection and apply a function over that collection to build them. This is the equivalent of that closure apply hash map to that collection to build a hash map from a variable number of items in a, in a vector. And finally, the same map we saw before. This takes map, instead of taking a function, takes a quotation, which we said was the equivalent of an anonymous function. And for each item in that collection, one, two, three, four, it'll put each item on the stack and then invoke the quotation with that item on the stack. Um, a little bit different in terms of the semantics of what we said before for closure. It's not applying a function across a collection, it's working with the stack, applying, you know, invoking quotations along the way. So, that's kind of hard. Um, let's look at how we define where our own functions. So, most concatenative languages uh, don't have variables by default, right? It's point-free programming where you don't have named variables, but they're useful. And uh, even things like the factor programming language, which we'll talk about later, includes a way to have variables. Um, I could make up a syntax for variables, but Clojure already has an excellent facility for co naming things that just need to be, in this case, stateful, so this is an atom. Uh, the second line is the function definition, or the word definition for Gershwin, um, times two. The, fir the second thing you see there may look like uh, a set of parameters, but it's not. It's a stack effect. So uh, due diligence in most concatenative languages, stack-based languages, is to show what your word should do to the stack. Um, some languages like Factor even programmatically verify that if you say that these 10 words when used in combination should have this net stack effect, it checks. It uh, does an analysis of your code to make sure that you actually have the stack effect in place and throws a compiler error if you don't. Um, a to-do on the Gershman list. Um, so, how would I use that? If I put four on the stack and invoke the word times two, I get eight. And you'll notice I didn't include the times n equivalent here because at this point, you know, how, how would you make a times n word? A times n word would just be the multiplication word um, because there's no explicit currying. It's what I find on the stack. If it's not a word, I'll put it on the stack. If it is a word, I'll invoke it, right? Looking at the map equivalent here, I can map times two across that, or I can just replace that two times with my times two word above. You'll note, this is one of those the selling points for concatenative languages and one of the reasons that I wanted to explore it. There was no, to, to refactor the third code sample down, all we had to do was take two and the multiplication word, copy and paste them out into a times two word and put that word in its place. There's no explicit arguments passed in, there's no formal parameters in the word definition. So to refactor a given concatenative program, you can copy and paste at arbitrary points in your code flow, name them words and put the words in their place. Um, obviously, that, that adds mental overhead in terms of thinking about the stack and what the effect is, but it also allows you to uh, factor very seamlessly. Okay, so usually, it's just backwards, right? You just take what Clojure took, map, and a function and a collection, and Gershman takes the opposite. It takes the collection, then the quotation, then map. So let's look at it. I think it helps to look at this kind of, you know, in motion. This is our, this is our, our chopsticks composition. Start with map. What's the next thing map takes? It takes a function or a quotation. What's the next thing it takes? A collection. If so we, we start reading from the word or the function in question, it's usually in reverse. That's not too bad. Let's try one that's multi-line. Let's try a, a harder one. Okay, associ so associate's closure's way of saying given an associated data structure, I'm gonna give you a key and a value. Please add the key to the map and give it the value. So I'm gonna associ, I start with a map, I give it a key, I give it a value and I get a new, a new map with that entry added. Okay, again, it's just in reverse. Not too bad, not too bad. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Uh-oh. Did I mess up? That was in order, that one's the same. Okay. All right, so if, there's a couple things going on here, right? So in the closure version, if is a, uh, if is a macro that takes three forms, right? It takes a condition, a then branch, and an else branch. Um, so the condition is if the answer is 42, everything's okay in the universe, if not, something's gone wrong. Um, what's going on in the Gershwin version? So we read from left to right, top to bottom, like we do. Um, answer is some p bit of data, it should equal 42. And the equals, equals word will put, will take those two arguments, answer and 42, and say, do these equal? If they do, I'll put a Boolean on the stack and say, yes, they do. Um, so now I have a Boolean and then two quotations. A Boolean, then okay, else bad. And then finally, in proper concatenative fashion, the word is at the end. Um, why is it that way? Uh, I think 
for several things. We think about, you know, when we reason about conditions, for example, there's a human tendency to think of if, then, else. And it's hard, um, you know, the, it's hard to rethink some of those, those, uh, so those orders. And so for certain things like if, for certain things like some mathematical operations, um, I've taken my cue from the factor programming language, um, it goes in reverse, reverse order, or in normal order. So <laughs> if, then, else. Uh, the other thing to note about this is that um, why did we wrap the then and the else branches in quotations? Um, if is just a word. And one of those other selling points that gets you really excited about uh, stack-based languages, you start looking at old fourth posts, and some of those fourth posts show the beginning of a fourth implementation is defining the comment word, and it says now we have comments in our code, and so you've defined how to have comments at the very beginning, and you can use comments from then forward. Um, the word is this kind of atomic um, function-like mechanism that has supreme power over a stack-based language. In this case, if is just a regular word that takes two quotations, and a quotation delays evaluation until you call it, until you invoke it. So instead of having if be a special form or a macro, in this case, it's just a regular word that takes quotations, and those quotations get invoked based on the Boolean. All right. Yeah. It's, we're not happy, right? Reverse and reverse. But some things just read both ways, right? Even in Arabic, you read words right to left, but numbers read left to right. That's 2009, right? So there's a, there's a precedent, even in human languages. The other part of learning words and phrases in a human language and of learning programming languages is sometimes you don't really learn what they mean when you learn them, right? When you first day of French class, comment allez-vous? They don't talk about, you know, what person and number aller is. Boot starov, Russian for, you know, bless you to a friend. You're not talking about the fact that boot is an imperative and that zdarov is a short form adjective. You just learn as bless you and you say it, you know, like that. And ahlam asahlan in Arabic, hi. It doesn't just mean hi. Right? But there's more there. But we learn these phrases as, as, human as learners. We learn them in phrase chunks because they're meaningful in those chunks. And later on, we'll learn the component parts. The same thing happens for programming languages, as we well know. Copy and paste code. Oh, this does this magic method does this thing. I'll copy and paste it. Closure is relatively devoid of such things, in my opinion, in my experience. Things generally look, you know, have, a, have a reasonable core function and kind of uh, work the way you expect. One of my hiccups when learning closure was how do you ask whether or not a vector has an item in it? Um, as the beginning learner, you find the contains function. You're like, oh, yes, it's the contains function. It's going to be the contains function. No, it's not the contains function. <laughs> the contains function has a purpose. It uses associated data structures and says, does this associated data structure have the key I'm interested in? Um, so you ask around, and you finally find there's, a, there's an idiom for this. It's a little tough at first, right? So we hearken back to the fact that sets, like other collections, can be functions, and some takes a function, a predicate, and a, takes each item off the, the li, of, of, out of the collection, and the first item that has, is truthy, it'll return that value out of the list, and that value will be truthy. So this is a way of finding, of, of saying whether or not a, a vector has an item. But in general, I want to argue that closure is relatively devoid of, of uh, these hardships. All right, so we just looked at how Gershwin gets executed. What did I have to change to the compiler to make this work? Um, we added words, we added quotations, that was it. What happens in the compiler? Um, Gershwin, as I said, can compile closure code. So if you just use a Gershwin, Gershwin jar, like you would use a closure jar, you won't know any different. Um, but if you decide to use the entry points defined by Gershwin, then you'll get some Gershwin extra uh, handling. Um, so Gershwin main, parallel to closure main, provides an entry point for uh, starting a Gershwin REPL and for loading files. Um, the difference in the REPL is mainly that it, it prints the stack instead of printing return values from things being invoked. Um, the compiler itself, again, additive changes. So the main kind of the main load function, the compiler is compiler load. The other ones load file, etc. But load is the main one. It takes one extra argument, which says, "Am I in Gershwin world or am I not?" And that's it. If you're not in Gershwin world, it's just closure. If you're in Gershwin world, it's Gershwin. Um, I said there's no parentheses in Gershwin. I lied. There is. It's for closure interop. Whenever Gershwin meets the parenthesis, it says, okay, I give up. It's closure. Um, so you can have things like def my data in the middle of your code because you need a, you need a variable, and you, don't want, to, you want to, don't want to work around the fact that a concatenative language shouldn't have variables. All right, so when we're evaluating Gershwin code, there's only two things that Gershwin cares about. If it's a word, if it's not a word, just put it on the stack. If it's a value, if it's a number, if it's a literal, if it's a regex, if it's whatever it is. If it's a word, I want to invoke it when it's met. Um, this is just closure function turtles all the way down um, in the compiler. So if you look in the closure compiler, you'll see um, very clean 
uh, delineation for how each form in the language is evaluated, and then you look at the ASM Bytico generation, you're like, thank you, Rich, for doing that for me. Um, and so I, we're not gonna reinvent functions, they're already there. So in the compiler, Gershwin transforms regular, regular uh, values and words into function invocations that either put things on the stack or invoke words that do things to the stack. So we've talked about the stack, it's this ominous beast hanging in the background the whole time. You have to keep the stack in your head. Um, how is it implemented? It implements iPersistent stack, which is a, a, an interface provided by Clojure. It gives us free access from Clojure to say things like peek and pop off of our stack. Um, but under the, under the covers, it's written as a Java file, but under the covers, it's just using Clojure vectors, and Gershwin stores that as a, as a var um, in the Gershwin core namespace, which allows us to rebind the stack. So for example, if I want to do things like pmap, and I want to have a clean stack per thread, and not worry about any kind of clashes over, over a shared stack out in the ether, I can just have my own local stacks and not worry about the fact that uh, they might clash. So that's sort of the dynamic bar in Gershwin Core. All right, so all that being said, you've seen a couple of small, mini examples of stack-based, of, of Gershwin, which is um, kind of inspired from fourth and from factor. Um, how can we describe what the stack-based approach is? Why would you care? Seeing these, why would you go further? Why would you study stack-based languages? What would compel you to? Um, and I'm gonna steal Michael Fogus and all of his descriptive power from the next few slides. Um, he, you know, in his Perlis Languages blog post, he goes through, and the first one he picks is Joy, which is another stack-based concatenative language. And uh, he has some, he has some you know, succinct things to say about how it works. As we saw before, functions, words, are never explicitly passed any arguments. Again, the flow is data, 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 word. It's gonna do something in that data, 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 word, data, word. Um, and when, when Gershwin meets a word, it just invokes it. There's no specific call this word with these arguments. It uses the stack. As we said, an implicit stack maintained by the language. As Fogus says, this is totally insane, right? I mean, like, you can't keep more than three things in a stack in your head at one time. You really can't. Um, maybe you can, I can't. But he argues that um, if done correctly, that you can achieve levels of succinctness and elegance that are stunning, and uh, I will, you know, code examples and things like the factor programming language are, are a great testament to that. Um, this is accomplished by vigorous, this is his words, vigorous factoring of words. Um, and I saw before that factoring words is not really refactoring, it's just factoring. Oh, I wanna take this part of my code, I can just copy and paste, define a new word, put the name right there, and it just works because again, it's just the data flow. Um, when you have a lot of stack manipulation going on, like you have three things top of the stack and you wanna do something to the third one, you gotta move it, duplicate it, does it consume it? You, that is a signal to you, the programmer, that you're, you're getting in the weeds and there are other ways to, to frame it better. So, uh, I wanna talk about factor at this point to kind of introduce the real niceties of Gershwin's concatenative API because it's from factor. Um, factor is a concatenative language and this just summarizes what a, a, uh, that a stack-based language is. A factor is a series of words, functions, that manipulate a stack of references to dynamically typed values. Works for closure, we're dynamically typed. All right, so, real quick primer um, on stack manipulation in, you know, this has a data stack, one, two, three, three is on the top of the stack, then two, then one. If I drop the topmost item, I drop that three, I now have one, two. Swap, I can swap the two items on the top of the stack, two and one. I can duplicate the topmost item, dupe, okay? This is, again, super quick primer on basic stack manipulation. I can rotate things. If I start with one, two, three again on the stack and I rotate them, I get the, the third item put to the front. I can hop in there and remove the second item. So we had one, three, two. I nipped three, it's gone now, I have one, two. I can over items, I can take in this case, the two one becomes two one two. I took the two and duplicated it, put them on the top. And then finally pick. And this has, I have three items here, one, two, three, and I get the third and I duplicate it on the front. So this kind of defines most of the primitive stack manipulation functions. One needs to refinagle the stack to perform you know, basic, basic functions. Um, but as Fogus said, if you have a lot of this in your code, you can't reason about that, right? You write like dupe, slip, flop, twip, twop, dupe, you know. Come back two months later, you have no idea why you were swapping right there and duping right there. Um, so you need, you need better ways for most situations to frame what you, the intent of the stack manipulation. And just like in Clojure, there are ways to deal with functions in a higher order fashion. Factor provides a higher order set of stack manipulation operators called data flow combinators. 
And this is where the really interesting stuff comes in because now we're not worrying about like swap, dupe, dupe, dip, nip. It's, I have code I wanna run, I have a stack in this state, it needs to be in this state afterwards, how can I reason about in kind of an equational way what the stack looks like now and what I want it to be. So, factor defines four basic data flow combinators. They are preserving, cleave, spread, and apply. Preserving is kind of the, the outlier. It temporarily hides values on the stack while you do other things. And the other three are ways of taking one or more quotations and one or more pieces of data and doing things with them in concert. So cleave takes multiple quotations, applies to a single value, spread multiple quotations to multiple values, pairwise, they have the same number, and apply takes a single quotation and gives it multiple values. So let's look at these examples and see what that might look like. Again, I'm use simple math so we can kind of reason about the stack in our heads, maybe. maybe. Preserving combinators. If I put four and five on the stack, and I have a quotation that times the top thing by two. Dip is gonna take the five off of the stack, invoke that two times quotation, which gives us eight, and it's gonna put five back on the stack, the first item. So dip takes the second item off, invokes the quotation, puts it back on. So this is a preserving combinator, preserve the five. The uh, other preserving combinator is keep, which instead of taking that five off, keeps it there, invokes quotation, and then puts it back on. So here we had four and five again, we invoke two times, give us 10, and we put the original value of five back on the stack. So the two preserving combinators are defined in Gershwin from the factor API. Cleave combinators. Notice there's no dupes, no keeps, no overs. Um, so I have two quotations and a single piece of data, and I want to invoke them and put those values back on the stack. I put two on the stack. I have two quotations, one for times two, one for times three. The, the resulting stack is four and six. Two times two is four, three times two is six. Try is also a cleave combinator. It takes three quotations. And so we have two times two, two times three, two times four. Gives us those values on the stack. All of these combinators also have their extra arity equivalents where uh, you're either changing the number of arguments to the quotation or the number of quotations being used. So uh, I, I refer you to Gershwin's implementation for those. Spread combinators. I have n number of pieces of data, I have n number of quotations, I wanna do things to those things pairwise. So two times two, three times three, gives me four and nine. Imagine what you'd have to do if you wanted to manually manipulate the stack to put those guys in place and put the quotations, put them back. Um, right. And then try, just like the previous slide, takes three and does it with three things. Okay. Spread combinators. Apply combinators, finally. I have a single quotation and I want to uh, give it multiple items up the stack by default two. So times two for two, times two for three gives us four and six, and try. So all these mirror factors, names for these data flow combinators, except where they obviously conflict with closure naming convention, you can't have special symbols at the front, so I put the special symbols at the back of the word. So um, if you're referring to factor and Gershwin in parallel, you can kind of look at these in, in, in parallel, they should be functionally equivalent. All right, so we've given a preview of some small mini examples um, when would you use Gershwin? As I said, what's, what's wrong with Clojure? I, I really enjoy Clojure, I hack on it all day. Um, when might you use Gershwin? What are the use cases? This is a, a, a tweet recently uh, by Chris Ford. Um, he's talking about when he's designing you know, systems, um, oftentimes there arises two ways of, kind of, of working through your, of building out your Clojure language, if you will, building out your use of Clojure. A lot of times things work great if you I just do regular functional composition, as you would in most functional languages. But Clojure also has uh, these arrow macros that allow you to thread, these thread macros that allow you to thread forms through several expressions. Um, and it, you know, they have different, uh, different characteristics. Um, so let's look at a couple of examples and see what he's talking about. So I have some data. It's a vector of map entries. And if I wanted to get the value for the lang key of the first content, content of the first item in that vector. This is one way to accomplish that. I can compose these functions. I compose first and then content and then first and then lang, and I can uh, pass data in as an argument, I'll get closure. Now wait a minute, we said stack-based languages were in reverse, but I had to read that from right to left to reason about in what order the, the, the functions will be applied to the data. So oftentimes it, it feels right and it works better in closure to thread things through, because it starts to read more like we would kind of reason, talk about it out loud. I can thread data and pass it to second and then pass the return value of that to the content function, to first and to lang and get uh, Gershwin. It's the second item in the list, first uh, sub item. So this is a way of kind of in a more natural order to say, given a piece of data, 
thread it through these functions and give me something at the end. That is what Gershwin does. That's, that is what concatenative languages do. They are like the threading macro on steroids. That's just the default behavior. You put data in place, you invoke words, and it's threaded through. Um, so this is, so, and so in one Gershwin use case is when you have arrows in your code, and uh, you're, write, you're writing things that make sense in kind of a, that, that order, um, Gershwin's off, often effective. All right. All right, so we've worked through phonetics, pronunciation, the syntax of the language, we've worked through the, the, the meat and potatoes, the words and phrases, functions. What's that last level for language mastery? Um, you know, and I'm gonna just glob all of language learning into sentences and paragraphs at this point. Um, well, it's true, right? So when, you, when you're graded as a language learner, um, when you get past words, you get into sentences. And you, get, you, you can speak sentences, you can survive on the street. You go to that kiosk, you ask that woman for like that pirashki, and you can transact, right? But you really can't survive in a college seminar. Um, so to be fluent in a language, you really have to get to the paragraph level of discourse. You have to be able to talk about a beginning, a middle, and an end. You have to have transitions. Um, what's the program equivalent of that? It's what we do every day. It's building actual applications, the high-level modular components we put together to build real systems. Um, what does Clojure provide for that modularity? First of all, it provides namespaces. Um, every language needs to provide namespaces, <coughs> JavaScript. Um, <laughs> if there's no other reason I use ClojureScript in the, in the UI, it's to have namespaces for my, for my client side code. Um, all kinds of things in Clojure for building out the larger components, the architectural components for applications, to include things like how does it handle dispatch, multiple things, which is multi-methods, which is arbitrary dispatch, protocols, you have access to Java interfaces when you need them. Um, how do we f show data flow in the application? We just saw examples of functional composition, er the threading macros, um, and Clojure says, you can use state, but we're gonna make it scarce, right? It's a functional language, um, global mutable state should be at a minimum, and the goal should be functional purity where possible. So if we take these three categories that I've arbitrarily put for language construction and we consider them kind of where they sit, right? There's the micro-level concerns that we are all, as language geeks, super interested in. Like, how did you really implement those closures? Um, you know, is it, is it all, the, all the lower level functions? Um, and then the higher level, you know, macro-level concerns. At the macro level, it's how do we build the programs, right? How do we architect the things we're building every day? At the micro level, and this is the important part, and this is why I think um, Gershwin using Clojure as its extension language is the best choice, because this is how you trust your program, right? This is the foundation on which you reason about your code, you know when things change, when they don't, you know how threads work, you know how time works. Um, so what is, you know, what is Clojure's micro-level um, set of, you know, guarantees? And uh, it has these opinions, and they're, they're highly effective, right? It's a functional language, it is a lisp, um, but a lisp that doesn't allow you to just arbitrarily add crazy syntax like I did, um, but with reader macros. Um, it has, you know, well-known and understood concepts for these separate things, which are identity, state, value, and time. And lastly, it's a hosted language, um, which means that you, having spent, you know, 10 years on the JVM, can move from Java to Clojure and have all of the hosted part of Clojure's runtime semantics already kind of understood, because it's hosted language either on the JVM, the CLR, or JavaScript. So this provides a foundation for a language implementation that uh, is well understood, well defined, and uh, easy to reason about. Okay, we're gonna get the inflammatory quotes now. Again, Michael Fogus, a language that doesn't affect, let you affect the way it thinks is not worth growing. Right? This, is, this is the argument for closure as an extension language and Gershwin as an experiment in extending that language. Um, all these permutations of this quotation are from, um, are from uh, Alan Perlis, we'll get there. Um, so what are extensions to closure that already exist, right? And what do we mean by extension, right? So core async, one of the things that was mentioned about core async uh, is, and Rich mentioned it during uh, the introductory podcast, um, it can be implemented as a library in closure, right? And part of it has to do with the fact that it's a Lisp and that the state machine that powers core async uh, can be implemented behind a macro. Um, and that allows us to extend closure to the language with, the, you know, with a, an asynchronous API that would otherwise have to be kind of built in from the ground up. Other things like core logic, which we've seen uh, in other, you know, other conferences, um, having all of mini Canron, which is a, a, a logic-based Lisp system in Clojure, and you can stop doing functional Clojure and start doing logic Clojure and get back into functional Clojure, so that for parts of your application that were better expressed as a logic run with logic semantics can be inserted. 
um, things like core typed, which Ambrose has been doing, and then things like datomic, you know, querying languages like datomic data log and Cascal log. And finally, I'll put Gershwin at the bottom here as another way of extending closure. I did the most damage by actually hacking on the compiler. Um, but these are all extensions to closure that are possible due to those micro level concerns that closure has um, and guarantees. So this is the origin of all those quotes. A language that doesn't affect the way you think about programming is not worth knowing. And then the most inflammatory version Michael Focus has come up with so far, if your programming language is in the tool for thought, then you're the tool. Uh, again, you know, uh, having a language like Clojure to extend and being able to say, I'll, I'm going to bolt on concatenative semantics to this, but still have all of Clojure beneath it is a powerful thing. And uh, it can, it's a telling story. So, when Gershwin, lots of errors in your code, maybe, that's one good one. Uh, I've used it to build a very simple system shell, um, so I can like boot up a Gershwin shell, and oftentimes when we're writing shell, we write commands that are both applicative, you know, grep and its arguments, and oftentimes that are concatenative grep and some things pipe to another function, and that pipe is the threading macro, that pipe is the concatenative approach of flowing data through multiple expressions. If it fits your brain or the problem, right, this is again that why, why Gershwin, um, certain things it fits very well. Uh, if you look in the factor uh, set of libraries, there's some excellent GUI programs that look very natural in a concatenative style um, for constructing GUIs. And then there's a couple of projects on the Gershwin GitHub. So anyway, if you want to explore more, I highly recommend the bottom two links to start um, Clojure's implementation and factor as the stack language of choice, and then this is Gershwin's website and the GitHub repo. Thank you. <laughs>